Section twenty seven, part two of Chapter seven of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone. Book one, Chapter seven, part two. Two. Besides the attribute of sovereignty, the law also ascribes to the king, in his political capacity, absolute perfection. The king can do no wrong. Which ancient and fundamental maxim is not to be understood, as if everything transacted by the government was of course just and lawful, but means only two things. First, that whatever is exceptionable in the conduct of public affairs is not to be imputed to the king, nor is he answerable for it personally to his people for this doctrine would totally destroy that constitutional independence of the crown, which is necessary for the balance of power, in our free and active, and therefore compounded constitution. And secondly, it means that the prerogative of the crown extends not to do any injury. It is created for the benefit of the people, and therefore cannot be exerted to their prejudice. The king, moreover, is not only incapable of doing wrong, but even of thinking wrong, he can never mean to do an improper thing, in him is no folly or weakness. And therefore, if the crown should be induced to grant any franchise or privilege to a subject contrary to reason, or in any wise prejudicial to the commonwealth or a private person, the law will not suppose the king to have meant either an unwise or an injurious action, but declares that the king was deceived in his grant, and thereupon such grant is rendered void, merely upon the foundation of fraud and deception, either by or upon those agents whom the crown has thought proper to employ. For the law will not cast an imputation on that magistrate whom it entrusts with the executive power, as if he was capable of intentionally disregarding his trust, but attributes to mere imposition, to which the most perfect of sublunary beings must still continue liable, those little inadvertencies which, if charged on the will of a prince, might lessen him in the eyes of his subjects. Yet still, notwithstanding this personal perfection, which the law attributes to the sovereign, the Constitution has allowed a latitude of supposing the contrary, in respect to both houses of Parliament, each of which, in its turn, hath exerted the right of remonstrating and complaining to the king even of those acts of royalty which are most properly and personally his own, such as messages signed by himself, and speeches delivered from the throne. And yet, such is the reverence which is paid to the royal person, that though the two houses have an undoubted right to consider these acts of state in any light whatever, and accordingly treat them in their addresses as personally proceeding from the prince, yet among themselves, to preserve the more perfect decency, and for the greater freedom of debate, they usually suppose them to flow from the advice of the administration. But the privilege of canvassing thus freely the personal acts of the sovereign, either directly or even through the medium of his reputed advisers, belongs to no individual, but is confined to those august assemblies, and thereto the objections must be proposed with the utmost respect and deference. One member was sent to the tower for suggesting that His Majesty's answer to the address of the Commons contained high words to fright the members out of their duty, and another for saying that a part of the King's speech seemed rather to be calculated for the meridian of Germany than Great Britain. In farther pursuance of this principle, the law also determines that the King can be no negligence or latches, and therefore no delay will bar his right. Nullum tempus occurret regi is the standing maxim upon all occasions, for the law intends that the king is always busied for the public good, and therefore has not leisure to assert his right within the times limited to his subjects. In the king also can be no stain or corruption of blood, for if the heir to the crown were attainted of treason or felony, and afterwards the crown should descend to him, this would purge the attainer ipso facto. And therefore, when Henry the Seventh, who as Earl of Richmond stood attainted, came to the crown, it was not thought necessary to pass an act of Parliament to reverse this attainder, because, as Lord Bacon in his history of that prince informs us, it was agreed that the assumption of the crown had at once purged all attainders. 
neither can the king, in judgment of law, as king, ever be a minor or under age, and therefore his royal grants and assents to acts of Parliament are good, though he has not in his natural capacity attained the legal age of twenty-one. By a statute, indeed, 28 Henry the Eighth, C. 7, power was given to future kings to rescind and revoke all acts of Parliament that should be made while they were under the age of twenty-four, but this was repealed by the statute 1 Edward VI, C. 11, so far as related to that prince, and both statutes are declared to be determined by 24 George II, C. 24. It hath also been usually thought prudent, when the heir apparent has been very young, to appoint a protector, or guardian, or regent, for a limited time, but the very necessity of such extraordinary provision is sufficient to demonstrate the truth of that maxim of the common law, that in the king is no minority, and therefore he hath no legal guardian. Third, A third attribute of the king's majesty is in his perpetuity. The law ascribes to him, in his political capacity, an absolute immortality. The king never dies. Henry, Edward, or George may die, but the king survives them all. For immediately upon the decease of the reigning prince in his natural capacity, his kingship or imperial dignity, by act of law, without any interregnum or interval, is vested at once in his heir, who is, eo instanti, king to all intents and purposes. And so tender is the law of supposing even a possibility of his death, that his natural dissolution is generally called his demise, demisio regis vel corone, an expression which signifies merely a transfer of property, for, as is observed in Plowden, when we say the demise of the crown, we mean only that in consequence of the disunion of the king's body natural from his body politic, the kingdom is transferred or demised to his successor, and so the royal dignity remains perpetual. Thus, too, when Edward the Fourth, in the tenth year of his reign, was driven from his throne for a few months by the house of Lancaster, this temporary transfer of his dignity was denominated his demise, and all process was held to be discontinued, as upon the natural death of the king. We are next to consider those branches of the royal prerogative, which invest this our sovereign lord, thus all perfect and immortal in his kingly capacity, with a number of authorities and powers, in the exertion whereof consists the executive part of government. This is wisely placed in a single hand by the British Constitution, for the sake of unanimity, strength, and dispatch. Were it placed in many hands, it would be subject to many wills. Many wills, if disunited and drawing different ways, create weakness in a government, and to unite those several wills, and reduce them to one, is a work of more time and delay than the exigencies of state will afford. The King of England is therefore not only the chief, but properly the sole magistrate of the nation, all others acting by commission from, and in due subordination to him. In like matter as, upon the great revolution in the Roman state, all powers of the ancient magistracy of the commonwealth were concentrated in the new emperor, so that, as Gravinia expresses it, in injuis unionis persona veteris republicanae vis atque magistus per cumulatus magistratuum potestatis ex primabatur. After what has been premised in this chapter, I shall not, I trust, be considered as an advocate for arbitrary power, when I lay it down as a principle, that in the exertion of lawful prerogative, the king is and ought to be absolute, that is, so far absolute, that there is no legal authority that can either delay or resist him. He may reject what bills, may make what treaties, may coin what money, may create what peers, may pardon what offences he pleases, unless where the Constitution hath expressly, or by evident consequence, laid down some exception or boundary, declaring that thus far the prerogative shall go, and no farther. For otherwise the power of the crown would indeed be but a name and a shadow, insufficient for the ends of government, if, where its jurisdiction is clearly established and allowed, any man or body of men were permitted to disobey it, in the ordinary course of law. I say in the ordinary course of law, for I do not now speak of those extraordinary recourses to first principles, which are necessary when the contracts of society are in danger of dissolution, and the law proves too weak a defence against the violence of fraud or oppression. 
and yet the want of attending to this obvious distinction has occasioned these doctrines, of absolute power in the prince and of national resistance by the people, to be much misunderstood and perverted by the advocates for slavery on the one hand, and the demagogues of faction on the other. The former, observing the absolute sovereignty and transcendent dominion of the crown laid down, as it certainly is, most strongly and emphatically in our law-books, as well as our homilies, have denied that any case can be exempted from so general and positive a rule, forgetting how impossible it is, in any practical system of laws, to point out beforehand those eccentrical remedies, which the sudden emergence of national distress may dictate, and which that alone can justify. On the other hand, overzealous republicans, feeling the absurdity of unlimited passive obedience, have fancifully, or sometimes factiously, gone over to the other extreme. And because resistance is justifiable to the person of the prince when the being of the state is endangered, and the public voice proclaims such resistance necessary, they have therefore allowed to every individual the right of determining this expedience, and of employing private force to resist even public oppression. A doctrine productive of anarchy, and in consequence equally fatal to civil liberty as tyranny itself. For civil liberty, rightly understood, consists in protecting the rights of individuals by the united force of society, Society cannot be maintained, and of course can exert no protection, without obedience to some sovereign power, and obedience is an empty name, if every individual has a right to decide how far he himself shall obey. In the exertion, therefore, of these prerogatives, which the law has given him, the king is irresistible and absolute, according to the forms of the Constitution. And yet, if the consequence of that exertion be manifestly to the grievance or dishonour of the kingdom, the Parliament will call his advisers to a just and severe account. For prerogative, consisting, as Mr. Locke has well defined it, in the discretionary power of acting for the public good, where the positive laws are silent, if that discretionary power be abused to the public detriment, such prerogative is exerted in an unconstitutional manner. Thus the king may make a treaty with a foreign state, which shall irrevocably bind the nation, and yet, when such treaties have been judged pernicious, impeachments have pursued those ministers, by whose agency or advice they were concluded. The prerogatives of the crown, in the sense under which we are now considering them, respect either this nation's intercourse with foreign nations, or its own domestic government and civil polity. With regard to foreign concerns, the king is the delegate or representative of his people. It is impossible that the individuals of a state, in their collective capacity, can transact the affairs of the state with another community, equally numerous as themselves. Unanimity must be wanting to their measures, and strength to the execution of their counsels. In the king, therefore, as in a centre, all the rays of his people are united, and form by that union a consistency, splendour, and power, that make him feared and respected by foreign potentates, who would scruple to enter into any engagements that must afterwards be revised and ratified by a popular assembly. What is done by the royal authority, with regard to foreign powers, is the act of the whole nation. What is done without the king's concurrence is the act only of private men. And so far is this point carried by our law, that it hath been held, that should all the subjects of England make a war with a king in league with the king of England, without the royal assent, such war is no breach of the league. And by the statute, Second Henry V, C. 6, any subject committing acts of hostility upon any nation in league with the king was declared to be guilty of high treason. And, though the act was repealed by the statute, Twentieth Henry the Sixth, C. 11, so far as relates to the making this offence high treason, Yet still it remains a very great offence against the law of nations, and punishable by our laws, either capitally or otherwise according to the circumstances of the case. The king, therefore, considered as the representative of his people, has the sole power of sending ambassadors to foreign states, and receiving ambassadors at home. This may lead us into a short inquiry, how far the municipal laws of England intermeddle with or protect the rights of those messengers from one potentate to another, whom we call ambassadors. 
The rights, the powers, the duties, and the privileges of ambassadors are determined by the law of nature and nations, and not by any municipal constitutions. For as they represent the persons of their respective masters, who owe no subjection to any laws but those of their own country, their actions are not subject to the control of the private law of that state, wherein they are appointed to reside. He that is subject to the coercion of laws is necessarily dependent on that power by whom those laws were made. But an ambassador ought to be independent of every power, except that by which he is sent, and of consequence ought not to be subject to the mere municipal laws of the nation, wherein he is to exercise his functions. If he grossly offends, or makes an ill use of his character, he may be sent home and accused before his master, who is bound either to do justice upon him, or to avow himself the accomplice of his crimes." But there is great dispute among the writers on the laws of nations, whether this exemption of ambassadors extends to all crimes, as well natural as positive, or whether it only extends to such as are mala prohibita, as coining, and not to those that are mala inse, as murder. Our law seems to have formerly taken in the restriction, as well as the general exemption. For it has been held, both by our common lawyers and civilians, that an ambassador is privileged by the law of nature and nations, and yet, if he commits any offence against the law of reason and nature, he shall lose his privilege, and that, therefore, if an ambassador conspires the death of the king in whose land he is, he may be condemned and executed for treason. But if he commits any other species of treason, it is otherwise, and he must be sent to his own kingdom. And these positions seem to be built upon good appearance of reason." For since, as we have formerly shown, all municipal laws act in subordination to the primary law of nature, and, where they annex a punishment to natural crimes, are only declaratory of and auxiliary to that law, therefore to this natural universal rule of justice ambassadors, as well as other men, are subject in all countries, and of consequence it is reasonable that wherever they transgress it, there they shall be liable to make atonement." But however these principles might formerly obtain, the general practice of Europe seems now to have adopted the sentiments of the learned Grotius, that the security of ambassadors is of more importance than the punishment of a particular crime. And therefore few, if any, examples have happened within a century past, where an ambassador has been punished for any offence, however atrocious in its nature. In respect to civil suits, all the foreign jurists agree that neither an ambassador, nor any of his train or comities, can be prosecuted for any debt or contract in the courts of that kingdom wherein he is sent to reside. Yet Sir Edward Coke maintains that if an ambassador make a contract, which is good jure gentium, he shall answer for it here. And the truth is, we find no traces in our law-books of allowing any privilege to ambassadors or their domestics, even in civil suits, previous to the reign of Queen Anne, when an ambassador from Peter the Great, Tsar of Muscovy, was actually arrested and taken out of his coach in London, in 1708, for debts which he had there contracted. This the Tsar resented very highly, and demanded, we are told, that the officers who made the arrest should be punished with death. But the Queen, to the amazement of that despotic court, directed her minister to inform him that the law of England had not yet protected ambassadors from the payment of their lawful debts, that, therefore, the arrest was no offence by the laws, and that she could inflict no punishment upon any, the meanest, of her subjects, unless warranted by the law of the land. To satisfy, however, the clamours of the foreign ministers, who made it a common cause, as well as to appease the wrath of Peter, a new statute was enacted by Parliament, reciting the arrest which had been made, in contempt of the protection granted by Her Majesty, contrary to the laws of nations, and in prejudice of the rights and privileges, which ambassadors and other public ministers have at all times been thereby possessed of, and ought to be kept sacred and invaluable. Wherefore it enacts, that for the future all process whereby the person of any ambassador, or of his domestic or domestic servant, may be arrested, or his goods, distrained or seized, shall be utterly null and void, and the persons prosecuting, soliciting, or executing such process shall be deemed violators of the law of nations, and disturbers of the public repose, 
and shall suffer such penalties and corporal punishment as the Lord Chancellor, and the two chief justices, or any two of them, shall think fit. But it is expressly provided that no traitor, within the description of the bankrupt laws, who shall be in the service of any ambassador, shall be privileged or protected by this act nor shall any one be punished for arresting an ambassador's servant unless his name be registered with the secretary of state and by him transmitted to the sheriffs of london and middlesex exceptions that are strictly conformable to the rights of ambassadors as observed in the most civilized countries and in consequence of this statute thus enforcing the law of nations these privileges are now usually allowed in the courts of common laws Two. It is also the king's prerogative to make treaties, leagues, and alliances with foreign states and princes. For it is by the law of nations essential to the goodness of a league, that it can be made by the sovereign power, and then it is binding upon the whole community, and in England the sovereign power, quod hoc, is vested in the person of the king. Whatever contracts, therefore, he engages in, no other power in the kingdom can legally delay, resist, or annul. And yet, lest this plenitude of authority should be abused to the detriment of the public, the Constitution, as was hinted before, hath here interposed a check, by the means of parliamentary impeachment, for the punishment of such ministers as advise or conclude any treaty, which shall afterwards be judged to derogate from the honour and interest of the nation. 3. Upon the same principle the King has also the sole prerogative of making war and peace for it is held by all the writers on the law of nature and nations that the right of making war which by nature subsisted in every individual is given up by all private persons that enter into society and is vested in the sovereign power and this right is given up not only by individuals but even by the entire body of people that are under the dominion of a sovereign it would indeed be extremely improper that any number of subjects should have the power of binding the supreme magistrate and putting him against his will in a state of war. Whatever hostilities, therefore, may be committed by private citizens, the state ought not to be affected thereby, unless that should justify their proceedings, and thereby become partner in the guilt. Such unauthorized volunteers in violence are not ranked among open enemies, but are treated like pirates and robbers, according to that rule of the civil law, Hostis he sunt qui nobis, at quibus nost, publis bellum decrivimus, cateri latronis at predonis sunt. And the reason which is given by Grotius, why, according to the law of nations, a denunciation of war ought always to precede the actual commencement of hostilities, is not so much that the enemy may be put upon his guard, which is a matter rather clear of magnanimity than right, but that it may be certainly clear that the war is not undertaken by private persons, but by the will of the whole community, whose right of willing is in this case transferred to the supreme magistrate by the fundamental laws of society. So that, in order to make a war completely effectual, it is necessary with us in England that it be publicly declared and duly proclaimed by the king's authority, and then, in all parts of both the contending nations, from the highest to the lowest, are bound by it and wherever the right resides of beginning a national war there also must reside the right of ending it or the power of making peace and the same check of parliamentary impeachment for improper or inglorious conduct in beginning conducting or concluding a national war is in general sufficient to restrain the ministers of the crown from a wanton or injurious exertion of this great prerogative End of section twenty seven